Hey everyone, welcome to Founders 365 with me, Stephen Hagsey. Today I'm joined by Diego Bavero Volpe. I don't know if I nailed got it. Right. You nailed got the it. name great. perfect. Perfect, great. This is a good start. He is the founder of Volpe, a marketing and strategic partnership for brands, luxury brands, basically, and lifestyle brands. But Diego, you're going to explain it way better than I can. So welcome to the show. Hundreds of guests. Me. So uh, we, I love it. <laughs> yeah, we were just saying before I press live that I should have got a hat or something like that. <laughs> but a hundred guests. Uh, so welcome, and I uh, really appreciate you being the hundred guest, which you just found out about as well. So I did. Yes, I'm, 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 I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled yeah. to be the centennial guest. I mean, I think this is a this is a moment. I'm going to put this, this on my moment. CV later. <laughs> if anyone wants to send me like a hundred cupcakes or anything like that, yeah, yeah, feel exactly. free. I'll give you my address and you can do that. Um, <laughs> but welcome to the show. Uh, my first question is always just like, tell me about Volpe, what you guys do, what you're about and what you stand for. Thank you. Yeah. So Volpe is, um, as, as you briefly mentioned, it's a marketing and strategic partnerships uh, company. We work with brands in lifestyle, fashion and luxury, and we work with household sort of names in those those areas and we've been going around for like about just under three years and it's really an evolution of our my personal journey which which started with different businesses i my first ever sort of a world of employment um hat if you will was investment banking after that i left to start a hospitality development company which actually owned and operated restaurants bars and clubs uh we then sold that business and I went into technology and started a social payments company, which sold to American Express. So after that, and during that process, um, obviously collaborated with tons of different brands and as an, on a personal level, became a sort of ambassador to brands and had a sort of press profile around that. And that evolved into what we know as Volpit today, which basically leverages that, those relationships to um, help companies further their ambitions in connecting with a certain uh, aspirational demographic. And we've been, uh, knock on wood so far, doing a, a pretty solid job. And, you know, we've been lucky in that we've sort of, sort of um, gained all our clients through recommendation. Um, and uh, we're pretty, we operate in the background um, and let the brand do the, the shouting about themselves. So, uh, so yeah, I, I agree. I agree. It's, uh, you know, we, 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 our ambition is to really front load the brands so that they can uh, really just capture imaginations of their consumers. In terms of your background, then, you've had some impressive past companies. What made you go for a marketing company, the next one? What, what was that itch that you needed to scratch to develop this as Volpe? Yeah, I think it was. Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. It's really because throughout our different ventures in the past we've sort of had that uh, pain point personally mm -hmm. and um we noticed that a lot of the companies that were operating in the sort of marketing partnerships growth space were very much uh, transactional they're very much about just trying to get as much out of the businesses as possible in terms of financially and very mm -hmm. little value being added and partially that's because the system's broken you know it relied uh, the traditional marketing or, or even public relations companies relied heavily on tons of staff. They relied on, you know, these sort of outdated systems that no longer are relevant. And we saw that there was, you know, well, what we wanted to do and the, the systems that we created internally could be sort of replicated for external clients. And that's that's basically what we what we built before. And um, that's why, you know, we can keep our costs relatively low. And we could be a lot more agile and a lot more personable with our clients. And we have a sort of a golden rule that we don't take more than 10 clients a year, and which is in sort of conventional thinking, sort of sacrilegious. But uh, in our in our view, it's, you know, there's only so much that you can exploit your personal relationships and contacts for. And that's our USP really is that we can go and dig deep and really deep dive with our clients and give a real personal attention to their needs and growth sort of objectives and um, why is that so important to you because you mentioned that other companies marketing companies are much more transactional why did you have this conscious thought of going you know what we want to do things differently we want to be personal we only want to work with 10 companies at a time 
Yeah. So the, the, the reason was, again, it was really just because from our frustration or for ourselves yeah. and you know we started having these conversations with brands that we were collaborating with and they're like listen if if you guys can to replicate that system for us then we'd be really happy with that sort of idea and that's that's kind of it was born out of that really it was born out of the sort of conversations that we were having with what became our future clients mm. did you ever think that you would have a marketing company no <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. I mean, like it was, you know, we've never really existed in the service side of, of business. You know, sure. we've, we've created uh, platforms and we've created uh, brands, but we've never really existed in the service side. And, you know, it, there's no real reason for that. It's just it's never something that was in, in, intrinsically uh, appealing, I suppose. But um, if I have to say that this is probably the most um one of the most rewarding sort of projects I've, I've worked on and it's been it's been fantastic and really being able to sort of effectively be seconded into companies and really learn from the inside out how they function and, and adding sort of a new fresh life perspective to yeah. to those systems has been incredible because it's it's almost like in like if, if you think of like an actor how they can go into different films and and create different worlds sure. we're effectively doing that with with companies as well yeah you make it sound a lot more fun than a lot of other marketing agencies basically yeah <laughs> that's good it means i'm doing my job <laughs> yeah exactly uh so let's talk about your clients then because obviously you have a a really nice niche in terms of that lifestyle luxury side of things how have you sort of made your work different with them as opposed to those you know marketing agencies that have been around for tens of years that they've sort of probably a lot of them have been working with as well for a long time as well and then you're the new kid on the block coming in yeah so i guess like because we offer something different to what the conventional uh blue chip marketing companies uh offer um we don't really play in the sort of uh, advertising space which a lot of them do we don't really um, look to do, you know, overly elaborate, expensive campaigns. Ours are more targeted niche and very much about a certain lifestyle and a certain uh, sort of sensibility and certain to a set, to a certain extent, a certain level of taste that we can uh, we can basically bring to the table. And that is primarily because the brands we work with, we are also the target consumers. So we have a sort of a natural understanding of how they should or would resonate more with yeah. that sort of target demographic. And do you find that a lot of people are doing that wrong? Well, I, I think that people, again, to, to the point that I think there's a, a natural gravitation towards doing things the way they've always been. Mm, yeah. um, which doesn't necessarily equate to doing things the right way. Yeah. And um, because we're effectively outsiders in the sort of marketing sphere, if you will, um, we can do things our own way. And I think that that resonates really well with, with clients because it's, it's effectively something fresh and it potentially something that they wanted to explore internally, but they've had a sort of a logistical or red tape sort of uh, operational issues internally yeah. to execute things it's sometimes easier to collaborate with an outsider to really get those sort of um uh, out of the box ideas through yeah you mentioned about how you know some companies are uh, always do uh, as scared to maybe change what they've done in the past how do you get over that how do you get over with that objection when someone just goes well you know we've been doing the same thing for x amount of years we've got these results we're pretty happy with them how do you sure. get them to be, say look actually look let's try this new approach and uh trust me it'll work yeah i think that when companies come to us they're sort of past that internal conversation mm -hmm. and typically we're recommended by other clients so when we are enter the room if you will there's already a willingness to to get an outsider perspective or or change the sort of status quo of how things have been executed in the past um so we haven't had that much sort of convincing work about doing things differently, um, yeah. but rather it's more about encouraging and reinforcing that point that might already be an internal discussion. Yeah, amazing, which is a great place to be in, right? So you can just rock up into the room and get stuff done, which is the ideal yeah, exactly. situation. <laughs> That's, well, yes, <laughs> an, an ideal scenario, absolutely. As opposed to how many other people are suffering uh, to, to persuade clients. 
Uh, you're, yeah, you're, I mean, I think if if you're out pitching, it's not something we've we've really done to date. I mean, again, we, we we're pretty much a recommendation based yeah. um, service. Um, if you're out pitching, you would have to have those conversations a lot, I think. So if you have a if you're dealing with with brands or people that already have a, an impetus or a desire to to get to that point, but they might not have a game plan or a structure to do so, then obviously you can move a lot quicker and be a lot more agile, which is which is the space we like to operate in. Yeah. Talk to me about how you are as a founder and how do you like to run your businesses? Right. So in the past, I mean, I have had sort of lots of mini hats in different businesses <laughs> because we've had hospitality businesses, development businesses, tech businesses. But um, and I guess that framework looks very different in each one. Obviously, yeah. there's parallels that work across all those different uh, sectors. And those would be, you know, just in general, we talked about this a little bit, but it was, um, you know, front loading value to your end consumer. You know, it's just like instead of trying to ask for something, try to give something first mm-hmm. um, and really, really, really double down on that and just kind of, you know, go above and beyond what the, the certain expectation can be. That's true of any business, really. So it can work across sector. And beyond that, I mean, the classic thing that you learn early on as an entrepreneur is keep your costs down. <laughs> I mean, you learn that the hard way normally. <laughs> and, uh, totally did, so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It always works that way. So, you know, we certainly went through those points as well where, you know, when we were starting out, there was, you know, business was good and we, we just kind of kept loading on the cost. And then obviously, that's not how to run a business you have to you know try to keep your cost uh, at bay so that you can survive the the peaks and throats right yeah exactly and in terms of you know volpe as a business moving forward how do you predict you know we spoke about this a little bit before we came on live here but how do you predict like this current global epidemic is going to change things especially in your area because you know lifestyle luxury all these different areas some may say that they're not going to be super effect- affected because, mm-hmm. you know, uh, like super yachting, for example, I was I used to be involved in super yachting industry. And that sort of industry is, takes a lot for it to be affected. Uh, sure. But how have you seen in terms of what's going on? You know, you mentioned about uh, Cam Film Festival changing up, Sundance changing up. Do you think this is going to become the new, the new normal or what do you think is going to happen? Well, it's it's a, it's a great question, and in uh, well, I guess in short, no one really knows, right? But I yeah. I think that from what we see in the in the marketplace, from our conversations with clients, especially bigger brands, it's interesting because two things uh, or three things have happened. Number one, in terms of a sort of a general scope or perspective, there's a leveling of the playing field between independents and established brands, Ooh. which which is quite inspiring, actually. So, yeah. you know, when we when we have on one hand, we have very established global companies as clients. And on the other hand, we have independents. And actually, I see this as a really exciting time for this independence to really make a mark. Mm. Second thing is that obviously every company has to restructure how they communicate and how they think about both their supply, their production and also their end consumer sort of interaction so whether that's in a shop or in a restaurant or you know just selling something in general yeah that there's going to be some level of change just perhaps not necessarily operational but also there's a change of mentality from the consumer i think that obviously right now we're in the thick of it what it's going to look like in 12 months time we don't know i mean it'll definitely lag on people's mind but is there, you know, one could ask the question, is will it just normalize and then people will just carry on as they were before? Very likely people are, mm-hmm. you know, intrinsically don't like to change a huge amount about how they function. Yeah, it's a so, great you know, you, experiment almost. <laughs> oh, uh, completely, absolutely. You know, will will millions of people continue to wear masks out, of, out and about? Unlikely. I just yeah. don't see that happening, right? Um, that being said, you know, there there will definitely be a necessity for brands to to you know take it with a level of s- seriousness and mm. with respect so even if the consumer themselves is behaving different you know or the same let's say as they were before the brand should be able to 
um, treat that with, uh, as again, a level of sort of respect by, you know, providing the opportunity to basically comply with sort of the new normalization rules, with whether it's distancing or, you know, extra levels of cleanliness or whatever yeah. it is, right? So I think that, you know, we don't know what the end effects of this will be, but I definitely think that, you know, there will be opportunities that will arise from this that will also give us the opportunity to reevaluate things that we assumed were the way things always were. Again, yeah. it's it's a way to change the sort of uh, the, the the rules of the game in a, in a way, right? It's a real it's almost, shake it's up. All, like, you can almost say it's like press and reset. On a lot of yeah, things. exactly right. So we we discussed um, briefly sort of the film festival side of the world, and you know Sundance, which is one of the key marquee festivals yeah. around the planet, um, is now potentially not going to exist anymore. Potentially, it'll just be a digital festival. You know that these things is is there a real need to meet at a film festival? Maybe not. You know, it's like there's another way to do things. And now that we've seen that there's another way, everyone's been forced to basically reevaluate. There's different ways. So like when it comes to fashion, is it about your supply chain? You know, can you change it? Can you optimize it? Can it be more local? You know, all these different things. There's going to be a lot less waste. You know, can you make things on demand? All these kind of things that that change the real sort of global dynamics of 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 industry, really. Yeah, you you mentioned about how this is a really great time for those more independent companies to thrive off that side of things. How do you think they, what do you think is the best way for them yeah. to do that? Is it, is it to focus on that customer? Is it to focus on the, the e-commerce side of things or the marketing message that they're putting out there? What would make them thrive? Cause I'm sure the independents are the ones that are probably panicking the most. Yeah, of course. I mean, the downside of being an independent is that you don't rely you don't you don't have the resources of a globally funded company or potentially a, you know listed company or whatever yeah. it is that you know has billions of, <laughs> of billions dollars cash in cash in the reserves that exactly right so an independent you know very much relies on its sales so then if you take for example a fashion company a retailer they say okay well might have two shops and they rely very much on points of sale and being able to access the consumer and so forth however you know, a lot of companies, even today, we see this all the time that, you know, they've always treated digital as a nice to have, but not an essential way to communicate or even gain sales, which a lot of people that have done that well have made fortunes doing e-commerce because yeah. so much of the industry, of the global industry, even fashion or whatever, is still not taking uh, digital seriously, which is crazy. I mean, I mean, obviously it depends on your business model, but even companies like Primark are not online, which is like, you're like, why? This is like <laughs> totally bananas. And yeah. Obviously they have a supply chain sort of a constraint there and all that kind of stuff. But even so, like you just, it doesn't make sense. Uh, you know, you haven't really taken the time or energy or potentially had the opportunity to um, really see how you can make the most of your digital presence. Now, mm -hmm. a, a lot of independents are obviously just, you know, working from home and so forth, uh, their their teams. And now they really have that opportunity. And we see that that's where it becomes really exciting because two things I think will happen. One is that, you know, consumers are, are much more educated as well because they're spending time online, just reading and so forth. And I think that there's a, there's a sort of drive to really support independence over let's say multinationals yeah and second of all to that yeah exactly and then secondly to that there's also like a a i guess the independents have for the first time ever the ability to you know reach the consumer that's highly engaged that's online that's you know looking to shop around for things that are that are different yeah. And that's that's the, the space in which they can thrive. They can do, you know, public relations stuff online. There's a million digital publications that are doing very well. You know, they can do, you know, rebranding if they need to do website work, you know, social media, all this kind of stuff that potentially they haven't had the time or, or potentially the interest to do so. I mean, SEO, for sure, if you're an e-commerce brand, is still something paramount to your success, right? Mm -hmm. Same with search uh social marketing right so on social media and so forth definitely it's it's one of those situations where i think 
if you can't adapt and change during this time, you you'll probably struggle to do it at any time. Uh, and, and those independents that are thriving are the ones that have the ability to actually allow themselves to. Is that classic thing, you know, working on the company or working in the company? Uh, and the ones that can work on the company are the ones that will thrive. The ones that are worrying about everything that's going on in the world, they're the ones that are probably suffering a little bit more. Um, so let's fast forward. Let's future pay some stuff now then. So Volpe, as it stands, you know, you're doing very well. Three three years in, super exciting. What's next for you guys? Where do you want to take this brand? Um, and what's your big your big vision for it? Well, you know, our so the short term goal is just continue to grow. Um, I think that we're because we're a, sort of an in, in, we're in ourselves an independent in, in that sense. So we'll continue to grow that space. And I think that again, even for our services, there's going to be a huge amount of demand. I mean, everybody's mm-hmm. going to try to make um, the most of the the opportunity to get us in front of as many consumers as possible. That's one side. So, but our vision really is to expand that side of the business, the services side of the business, and also our venture side. So, I um, mentioned briefly that we have a, a sort of subsidiary company called Volpe Ventures, which invests in early, mid stage companies in growth. Um, and that, again, was born really because when we were in our first year of operating as Volpe, we were coming across a lot of it, sort of early, early stage companies that were like, mm-hmm. can you help us? Because it were like, well, look, you know, you really need to like structure your company better and you can really help, you know, you need to find investment and so forth. So before you can even contract us. Um, and that led to a lot of conversations with founders. And obviously we have, we are entrepreneurs in ourselves. So supporting entrepreneurs is, is sort of part of our ethos. So yeah. we ended up investing in, in, a, in a fair few companies. And today we have eight investments um, across the board and, and I think that th- that will continue to grow. It's a really exciting thing because, you know, we can support those companies very early stage sort of financially and then later on through our sort of services, right? Because we yeah. can do the marketing and growth and really help them make a difference. The other thing is because we have really good international sort of contacts across the board for pretty much every industry that we um, dabble in, mm-hmm. we can help them get access to people investors advisors retailers whatever um supply chain that can make a huge amount of difference to companies that are in that sort of um growth space yeah fantastic and that, that's super exciting i love the fact that you're you're helping founders you're helping younger companies uh, that's what it's all about i think it's about seeing the potential in others Agreed. That's why I love doing what I do. And it sounds like that's why you, you love doing what you do. Um, listen, Diego, one of my final questions to you is, uh, and one that I ask every single guest, but if you could give three uh, bits of wisdom from your experience to, an, to a fellow founder, perhaps one of those independents that have that opportunity to adapt, to structure things slightly differently, what would be those three bits of wisdom in the current situation that they can sort of implement straight away? Wow. Okay. So one, again, I think, you know, I repeat this because it's, it's essential is try to front load with value to the consumer before you ask anything of them. Um, just continue to, you know, treat them with, um, with respect, but also mm-hmm. with a, sort of a, with a mindset to continuously give them things that they need or want um, before you sell them anything. And that can be in the shape of oh, so many different things, but accessibility is key there. Um, two, I'd say, you know, definitely look at your sort of your cost and, and revenue sort of streams and, and look at try to diversify how those costs um, take place. So don't necessarily assume, like, for example, if you're a shop, a retailer, you know, don't necessarily assume that you need a physical premises as a point of sale potentially, you know, you should double down on e and, you know, instead yeah. of spending rents on, you know, Oxford Street, why not spend that money on socials and SEO and, you know, really doubling down your e-commerce presence, I think it'd make a huge difference in terms of your bottom line to, to a global audience. Um, and, and three is like, look at the situation that we are currently in and see if there's any opportunities that are underlying there. Like, for example, you know, we have 
you know, we, we briefly touched on this, but, you know, people are at home, they're working from home and the home workspace has not been properly exploited. If you think about how much of a revolutionary change that is in terms of how people's mindset, in terms of what their home and their work looks mm -hmm. like, imagine how you can leverage that to really create new opportunities for your business, whether it's with voice assistants like Alexa, you know, can you do some collaborations there? Can you do something exciting? Again, delivering value to your consumer directly within their home workspace. Um, can you, you know, collaborate with them with the, with the end consumer themselves and you know stuff that they can co-create with you or whatever there's a million different things that you can do but i think if you start thinking about it under that lens it, it becomes a really exciting time to really think about the changes that you can implement to your business yeah massively diego thank you so much for coming on this hundredth podcast uh, <laughs> thank and, you so much Stephen, and giving so much value uh if anyone wants to get in touch with you speak to you about volpe speak to you about um anything else that you're involved in what's the best way for them to do that um i would say you can well, you can always reach me on instagram it's i am diego bv um or you can reach me on email it's diego d-i-e-g-o at very so v-e-r-y volpe v-o-l-p-e dot com perfect diego thank you once again to come on and uh, i hope you're staying safe i know you're in the thank new you, forest, a lovely place to be and i shall Thanks. hopefully see you face to face after this lockdown in absolutely too soon for a drink exactly. <laughs> thanks everyone for listening and watching the swim founders 365 all the best